Okay, can everyone hear me at the back? At the back back, I saw thumbs up here, but not at the back back, is everyone good? Lovely, 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 amazing. So, I heard someone say, this is where the conference really starts. <laughs> I'm not gonna say that's true, but I think that did kind of prop up my ego a bit. But what I wanna do right now is take you all on a journey. So I wanna ask you all to close your eyes and imagine. Now, I'm not Vincent van Gogh or Pablo Picasso, but I wanna paint you a picture. I wanna bring you back to my experiences in 2015 with one of my friends. At the time, I was a year eight student in school in South East London, Lewisham, okay? And I had a friend, a very good friend of mine who was quite bright, good at sports, great at talking to the ladies, and in general, he was a great person to be around. But the UK's education system was not conducive to his skill set or personality. He was good at putting his hands up in class and working on projects, but he wasn't good in assessments. He was good at being someone that could encourage other students to do best, but he couldn't encourage himself. Revising day and night, coming back with Fs, E's, U's. He didn't see a C until the end of his GCSEs. In school, he'd get in a lot of trouble, exclusions, suspensions. He was even bullied in school by people. His teachers would tell him, you are not going to do well in life with this attitude. His peers would tell him, you belong in a pupil referral unit. His peers would even tell him, I have no idea how you're even in this school with your grades and your character because people like you aren't meant to thrive in this system. Now I'm gonna to come to some of you at random, you can open your eyes now, and I'm gonna come at some of you at random and ask you what you think my friend's outcomes are right now. So the first person I'm gonna to come to is you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope that he is successful and that he's learned to use his skills appropriately. I worry that he's fallen into the wrong side of the system and uh, as somebody else that grew up in South London and didn't do too well, you have to fight to get to where you want to be. So um, yeah, I hope he's done well for himself. Thank you. Okay, one more person I'm going to go to. People at the back thought they'd get away with it, so I'm gonna come to the back. <laughs> I'm gonna come to, can I come to you please? Lovely. Is he giving a talk at a conference uh, at the moment? Maybe. Maybe somewhere. So, you, took, you got my trick. You got my trick now. That young person was me. And look, now it's going to sound bad. I'm going to sound like a liar and all that kind of stuff. But the reason I did that isn't to big myself up. Everyone at Edge Foundation knows I'm the last person that talks about what I do and all that kind of stuff. But the reason I shared that is because a lot of people that I know that do the stuff I do and do the stuff that all these amazing young people do were the ones getting A stars, A's going to big schools, all that kind of stuff, right? I loved my school in year 11. Before that, I couldn't stand it. But in year 11, I loved my school and I loved my head teacher. But throughout school, never getting the grades, always being told you're not good at every, every, anything, you're stupid, all this kind of stuff, didn't support me to be confident in myself as a young person. Okay? And the fact with that is, so many young people work from primary school, four years old, five years old, six years old, seven years old, up until they're 16, 18, to do one exam that is on their CVs for the rest of their lives. Now, raise your hand for me if you think it's unfair that young people do exams at 16, 18, and it stays with them until they are 50. Proofs in the pudding, everyone. Thank you. So last thing I'm gonna say before I hand over to this amazing youth panel to share who they are and what they do, the last thing I wanna say is, if we are going to change the system, as young people, we need you. And although I'm saying young people and I'm saying it's a youth panel, I'm not, I don't want us to be seen as the token young people that speak at the events. I want you guys to see us as people that are professionals in our own right. Because when we did the briefing session, for this, the stuff these guys came out with 
blew my mind. And for us to make the system what we want to make it and change it for the better, we need all of your supports in this room. And I believe the fact that you guys have come here today, you want to support. So without further ado, everybody, please give it up for this amazing youth panel. So I'm going to start right next to me with a good friend of mine. Can you please introduce yourself, what you do, and also a fun fact about yourself? Because I know you have a very fun life. You're not like me. <laughs> so you can take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Lottie. I'm 20, and I'm a politics student from um, Southampton. I currently go to the University of Warwick, and I'm really passionate about education, education policy, and making sure people go through school actually being prepared for the future. Um, and my fun fact is that I'm a born Latin dancer. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Hi, my name's Kerry. Um, I'm currently studying at the University of Cambridge and it's a new foundation year that's just started this year, especially to help disadvantaged students with educational quality. Um, on top of that, I'm also a director of North Hearts Pride, which is a grassroots pride organization. Um, and a fun fact about me is that I'm a competitive cheerleader. Lovely, lovely. Hi everyone, my name is Ife. I am currently on a legal placement year. Um, I've studied two years of law school at Southampton University and I'm passionate about young people, education and law. You probably find me on LinkedIn talking about all three things. And a fun fact about myself, I've actually held a baby alligator on my head. <laughs> um, hi everyone, um, I'm Manya and um, I'm the Director of Outreach at the British Conservation Alliance. Um, I've also worked extensively in education philanthropy um, over the last two years um, in St Paul's School and also at Oxford University and um, I'm also a student at Oxford and um, my fun fact is that um, I'm in the Netflix series Bridgerton um, so if you watch season two and season three which will be coming out you might see me. Um, hi, I'm Billy Jean. Um, I'm the Student Union President at Leeds City College, um, so I organise events, campaigns, um, work a lot around student voice, student engagement, making sure that our students um, from 16 plus make sure they feel like they're having a good um, experience in college and like they have a voice. Um, and a fun fact about me, like a similar panel, panel member, sorry, um, is I'm also a competitive cheerleader and dancer. Lovely. So I just realized I didn't even introduce who I was. I just started talking. So my name is Jonas Andrew Phillip. And my fun fact is I support the team that happens to be top of the Premier League right now. Not to brag, <laughs> but we're going to win the league first time in 19 years. So I think we can all agree we've got amazing people on this panel. So the first question I wanted to throw out to all of you, and any of you can jump into this, and then we can just converse over that. So the first question is, is what three words encapsulate your experiences of school and assessments? Okay, I think I'll go first. First word I'd use is daunting. Um, this is associated with the more recent experience of university. I joined university at the time of COVID. You know, there was a lot of um, disorganization and I think it was more of a time where we didn't really know what was going on. So that was one word I'd use to describe school and assessment. Second word would be support and third word is actually resources. I was fortunate enough to go to a school where we had a great support system and a really um, great resource system. The teachers had a lot of resources to provide for us. So I think in that aspect, school and assessment wasn't too daunting or too hard for me. But I think it's when I got to university, the idea of sitting exams online and going to lectures and attending university online became a bit daunting. But prior to that, I think I'd had a really good experience of school and assessment. Yeah, but I'll go next. Um, my three words are busy, stressful, and unprepared. And if you'd met year 11 me, I was a literally mental. I'd get up at like 6 a.m. I wouldn't be back from school, clubs, dance until eight, nine, still haven't done my homework yet. Um, and I think that really encapsulates school, especially when it gets to exams, that you're doing a million and one things and that's encouraged, but you never have time to rest. Um, and that kind of links to my word stressful. Doing that many things at once is not, you know, healthy. <laughs> and then unprepared because you then go into later life knowing that you've got to be busy, productive, productive, and then not knowing how to stop. And then that causes you problems later on. So yeah, that's my three words. Oh, 
all eyes went to me then. <laughs> um, my three words to describe school and assessment would be challenging, different, and eventful. Um, my year 11 class was when the world, like, the world got locked down because of COVID. So obviously my exams were a lot different to everyone else. So I feel like kind of on an underfoot to maybe the rest of the students in the world. Um, they've all got to sit their exams. It was kind of my year that didn't get that experience. But when we did get that experience, the mocks and um, everything that went into that was really challenging and really eventful for multiple different reasons and I feel like there was a lot of contributing factors behind that as well. Um, my three words are competitive, challenging and um, elitist. Um, I had the opportunity to go to four different private schools from the age of four till I was 18 um, and each were very different. Some were non-selective, some were more um, academics, some were more into music and drama, um, so I had an experience um, across the board. However, one thing I would say um, more, I guess, on the, the elitist side is um, that in my sixth form we did um, collection exams, so at the beginning of each term we would have exams, um, and that's the same system which we have at Oxford. So we had insight into that um, prior to going, and also um, I took pre-U exams, which um, they are now discontinuing because they did um, make... A, the gap bigger between those who went to private school um, and uh, those who went to state system. So um, I would say that, um, yes, I did um, experience um, elitism and um, it did benefit me, but I can see in university how that has disadvantaged others. So, yeah. My three words are turbulence, ableist, and perseverance. Um, so the first one is turbulence. Between being taken into the care of the local authority and being autistic, I was never consistently enrolled in education, and I don't think I've ever been to the same school for longer than a year. My second word is ableist. I've often found the education system based on structures of internalized ableism, and where I found the most academic success has been where that ableism has been addressed. And my third word is perseverance. Um, so to continue my education, it's always been down to me. I've never had the privilege of a family or much uh, support. I've also found that I love education and learning. I believe it's the door to a better life, and I'm very thankful I persevered in my educational pursuits. Lovely, lovely. So what I'm getting, and you guys can tell me if you're getting something completely different from this, but what I'm getting from everything you said was all of you collectively that there was a lot of confusion going on during your schooling time, regardless whether you were a high achieving student, someone that like me that was in lower sets. So I think it's a situation where that creates a lot of stress for young people as well. And also it's funny because on the train here, TfL needs to fix up by the way, because I was, I was stopped for 20 minutes and I was thinking I'm going to be late. But luckily I wasn't though. But I think a lot of us are told to revise and to study, but when we're at home by ourselves, we, we don't know how to study or how to revise because you're never taught how to do that. So even for me now who's doing a, a project management apprenticeship, I'm looking on YouTube and searching up stuff to learn how to study, how to revise, because I'm not going to lie, I don't do less than merits or distinct, or no, I do distinctions. I don't do less than merits or passes. I want to get the highest grade I can. So, and that also creates more stress as well. I think the expectations that you put on yourself because you want to achieve greatness in your life. So with that, there's a lot of factors in life that can prevent you, I don't know if that's the right word, but from doing that. So my next question is, and again, throwing out to any of you to jump in if you want to, were there any contributing factors during your time in the UK's education system, for example, SCND, coming from a low income household like myself, that made your experience more difficult? I did my go first. Um, when I was in year 11, I had a bit of a rubbish time. And I was very, very fortunate to have a school that had support that they could throw at me. But the issue was that it wasn't student-driven and student-led. So it was, you will see a counsellor and you will go and do this. And I was like, well, what if I don't want to? Um, <laughs> and the issue there is that I'm being forced to go places that don't actually benefit me and don't help me. Um, so one thing I'd want to say for kind of the future is that when students are getting stressed out with assessment or struggling at home that that support that you can give however limited or you know large it may be is driven from the student and what they can benefit from it and what they can get from it. I 
agree as well. And I think I haven't really had any factors per se that have hindered or you know been a negative experience for me. But one thing I definitely noticed, um, I was telling the rest of the panel, I was fortunate enough to attend a private school from year 7 to year 11. And right from the get-go, there was a support system all the way throughout. And then I went to a state school for sixth form. And the first thing that I realized was I didn't actually know much about mental health. And the reason being was from year seven, the school were really good at ensuring that you were you know, feeling good. There was that support system. So I remember when a friend had a panic attack, I didn't actually know what that was. So I remember I thought she was just acting. So I was like, what's going on? And then I was enlightened that this is actually panic attack. This is all to do with mental health. So I think the nuances between both divides have allowed me to you know, notice that there are factors that can hinder people from excelling. And I would definitely say in my experience, the reason why some students aren't able to perform as well as they can in school is they don't have the support. Mm -hmm. Maybe at home, they lack the support. And so they go to school and teachers are overworked. They have a lot of students to manage. So they're not able to pick up on these things. And that's why I know I'm fortunate enough to have been to a school where from year seven, they were on to me. I had a house mistress. I had peer mentors that were able to notice when things were going wrong at home. They could step in. So I definitely say that that is something I've noticed in my experience can help students when there is that dedicated support system and there are resources to help those students. Uh, yeah, I don't mind going next. Um, so what made the school experience hard for me was I struggled a lot with my mental health from like year nine to year eleven. It was really difficult. Um, I also have a long-term health condition, which meant throughout, like from year seven to 11, I was in hospital quite a lot. Um, and having to do work online, obviously, before COVID and everything, like my teachers didn't really understand it. And it was kind of, oh, she'll catch up, she'll catch up, she'll catch up. And, and then when I got really poor grades at the end, it was like, oh, well, we sent her the work. And how can you do the work when you're laid in a hospital bed? Um, and obviously the students that were getting really high grades and you're like, oh, well, it's not my fault that I can't get the high grades. And I really did struggle with that. Um, and especially with my mental health as well. And when I had my friends around me, um, they was like, oh, we've got our exams, we're revising. And I'm like, well, that's not the only thing that's on my mind right now. I have other stuff going on. Mm. I can't just focus my life around exams. Um, and that was really stressful. And that was like a really challenging time in my life. But I think that's why now what I do, um, making sure that student voice is heard and that students do feel like they can come and speak to us is like a massive part of my role and that's why I've gone for it because I've been through the school system myself. I have had them challenges, so I know how it feels. Um, so there's not so much for myself, but um, definitely I noticed when I was working in the education philanthropy for bursaries for um, children who couldn't necessarily afford to go to private schools. The people who are affected the most are those who are um, in the lower, t uh, lower middle um, side because um, we offered bursaries for people who really were at the, the, the bottom end of the spectrum. The ones in the middle almost had no access to anything because, um, yeah, because they were in the, in the system. They also couldn't afford um, private tutorials or anything like that. So, um, I, yeah. Uh, Um, um, but yeah, um, I think that um, in order to bridge that gap, um, we should offer more um, uh, pri free private tutorials to people within that, um, that um, group because not that many people have access to it. So yeah. Um, so I'm a queer autistic care leaver with additional learning difficulties and I've been homeless uh, three times in my life and twice in the past year. When I applied to Cambridge University, where I'm currently studying, um, I, it was when I was homeless. I didn't think I'd get in, but I just needed something to hope for when everyone and everything had given up on me. Being with unstable parents and then in care, I was moved from school to school with huge gaps in between. Then once I was in school, I was years behind my peers, and that was before even adding my autism and additional learning difficulties into the equation. Support was a verity. I never had the privilege of having parents consistently enroll me in school to stand up for my additional needs or a quiet or safe place to study. I didn't always have a laptop, which was always an issue, but during the pandemic meant I needed to drop out of school entirely. Instead of extracurricular activities and making friends, I had to go to school without food or right off the streets or from domestic violence within placements. My education was never treated as something of value or as a priority, 
and I never learned to plan for or value my future. As well as the material support, which can improve students' chances in the educational system, emotional support is a huge and often undervalued um, aspect. Lovely. So firstly, can we get a round of applause for every one of these guys who just shared that? Look, as a young person myself, I can tell you for free, well, technically I'm an adult, 21, but, you know, <laughs> at heart, I'm, a, I'm still 16 at heart, I can't lie. But essentially, I want to say that, and you guys already know this, of course, it's not easy to share what every single one of these guys just shared. And they don't know most of you, you don't know, most of you don't know us. But I think the fact that they're willing to share their experiences and be vulnerable in this space shows you that they're willing to put aside their pride and fear to better education for young people coming up in the future that aren't even born yet, to be honest. And it's a thing of, obviously I mentioned in my opening monologue, the system. Now, to be honest with you, I hate the word the system because it makes it sound like a bit of a conspiracy theory thing. But the fact is, we're not bashing the system. As I said before, I hated the school system when I was in school, other than when I was in year 11. But now, if I was to go back to school, I think with the person I am now, I'm much more confident, I'm much more up for going for things in life, I think I'd enjoy it. And teachers are overworked, as these guys did mention. So sometimes they don't have the capacity to obviously cater to our needs because they've got so much work going on. And I've worked in a school, so I've seen it from a teacher's perspective and a student's perspective as well. So I know that you see something, you see something as a student, but the teacher sees something completely different. So I think communication between teachers, <coughs> students, parents, I think we need to all collectively improve that. And also, I feel that we need to support teachers more and give them pastoral care as well, because I think some teachers need therapy as well, because some of the stuff they see in the classrooms isn't normal for someone in your day-to-day -day life, especially in certain schools and people referral units and stuff like that. So I think we need to look after our teachers and staff members just as much as we look after our students, and we need to improve both. But back to the point about the system, a lot of people have been talking last year and the year before about resetting the system. And bringing in new ideas to better the education system. So the final question I have for you guys before we throw it out to all of you, for you guys to ask your questions. So please write down some questions if you haven't already for our lovely panel. The final question I want to ask you as chair is, if you had a magic wand, if someone came down, if say, I don't know, say I was a fairy and I flew down <laughs> and I said, Lottie, and I threw a wand at you on your head. And I said, Lottie, if you could reset one thing in the system by waving your wand, what would it be? This is my favorite question. I've been waiting for this one. Um, <laughs> basically, I'm a big hater of school councils. <laughs> I don't think they work. I think teachers often, um, well, this is more SLT, can use it um, to kind of as a checkbox exercise. And I'm not saying that is what they're trying to do, but I think it's easy to fall into that trap when students have five, 10, 20 things that are going wrong and that you have so much else on your plate. But that's just, it's not all they're for. It's supposed to be collaboration to make schools better. Um, so I think if I could go back, I would have scrapped my school council and put <laughs> young people onto governing bodies because I think that is where the most change can happen. And I think, I'm not talking your um, average school council where it's all high achieving or white middle class students, I'm talking every student in the school being represented on that governing body. Um, and I think that way it will help those students involved and it will change the school for a better because you've got a representative group of students whose views are actually taken seriously. Um, but yeah. I'm going to be a bit naughty and say two things. <laughs> First, there needs to be more funding for schools. That is a general fact that needs to be acknowledged. Funding is so important for schools. I have tutored students who, in a classroom of, let's say, 35 pupils, only one glue stick, one scissors. I mean, there needs to be more funding for them to have access to things, for there to be resources. And the second is, there needs to be mandatory obligation that every student completes either work experience or encounters employers before the age of 18. You cannot be going through the education system, quote unquote, and have to go through A-levels or get to university, you haven't been to a workplace, you haven't encountered an employer. Mm. And the Gatsby benchmarks, does anyone know what those are? Okay, a few people. Please go check that out. Gatsby benchmarks commissioned by Sir John Holman, essentially are eight benchmarks for schools to 
reach for students to encounter career professionals and you know get into the workplace these should be mandatory like legislation should include the eight benchmarks there are too many students who either drop out of school unfortunately or who do not even have any experience or haven't encountered a workplace because you know that there isn't a careers professional in their school or the school doesn't have a dedicated team to support in them so i'd definitely say my two is more funding and there has to be mandatory obligation for careers I think that um, a more holistic education should be um, included within the state system because um, not everybody has um, academic um, abilities and actually um, if you taught things like philosophy or art or music, things which are very um, active um, within, from, from the age of four, like we were doing Shakespeare from the age of four, if we, if we like let everyone do that, then we're more likely to see um, an increase in those who are doing public speaking who aren't necessarily academic. We, we're more likely to see people in government um, when they get older who didn't necessarily go to university. It's not, um, it's not um, a stipulation to have gone to university, but people think that's the only way at the moment. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, one, we should have a more holistic education. I think um, things like Steiner schools, um, um, I know it's very niche, but I think their system of teaching and, and assessment um, should be adopted by um, the um, government because it's, 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 it's more holistic and also because um, I think more people enjoy their education. Um, and you'll have children who will have better feedback, they'll have a better uh, life, actually. Um, so I do think that um, that should be um, uh, mandatory. And yeah, thank you. Um, so mine would be introducing mental health days across the entire school education system because what, where is the support when a student rings up and says, oh, I have a cold, when actually they're just having a really off day and they have to go into school the next day and I like everything's fine and then that is where the problem starts for that student. Um, so I would like introduce authorised mental health days as I don't think, like even in the college like where I work now, it's not recognised that if a student's having a bad day, they can take a mental health day, they don't exist. Um, so that is how I would reset the system because I do feel like they are massively needed, especially with our generation and the way we're growing up. There is a lot of changes happening around the world, especially regarding COVID and the cost of living crisis. A lot of students are struggling a lot more than they might have previously done in the years before and they do need that extra support now. So if we could have a system where if a student rings up and says, hey, I am having a bad day, I do need the day off, is there somebody that can give them a call and say, hey, do you need a chat? Why, why does that student have to ring up and lie, say they're not feeling well, when actually they, that's the support that they do need? Uh, so if I could change one thing, I would look at the attitudes towards students with additional needs. Um, so I've been to special needs schools before, and I found that the staff and teachers there their attitude towards my disability seemed to be trying to teach me how to pretend like it didn't exist, which I found you know, really damaging and ultimately didn't really help me in the real world. Um, but with one of my favorite things about Cambridge and the foundation here I'm on at the moment is that they do really seem to understand it. Um, so like for example, when I started Michaelmas term, I got you know, quite overwhelmed because it was a very new environment and a very intense one. Um, so there were moments where I would stim, which is um, behaviour specifically associated with autism, um, and I would need to stim in class. And my tutors, they would come over and ask me if I was okay. But then as soon as I said that I was, they would just let me stim however I wanted. So I would have lectures where they would let me sit on the floor in front of the classroom. And that not only didn't damage my education or didn't damage the education of anyone in the room, but it also really improved it because I could still listen, but in a way that was safe for me and my disability. And then on top of the actual experience in the classroom, it also taught me that I was safe to express you know, my needs when I needed them and safe to stim when I needed to. So then if you know, I was meant to go to another lecture and I was feeling a bit wobbly or a bit off, then I knew that I was safe to go because if I did have an issue, then I knew that I was safe to tell my tutors and that I would get the support that I needed. Whereas in other situations where their response was to act as though I didn't have a disability, then if I felt a bit wobbly, I wouldn't feel safe to attend because I knew I would be forced into a situation that wasn't suited for me. So I think that that's really important and I think it's quite interesting how a lot of special schools, well from my experience at least, 
a lot of special schools who kind of advocate to attract disabled students end up enforcing a very harmful belief about the world. Mm. Lovely. Thank you guys so much for that. And I'm actually going to say my answer to this as well. I was just thinking about it as you were all talking. And this has been something that I've been thinking about a lot in my spare time when I'm not asked, watching Arsenal win every single game. I've been thinking about this in my spare time. And it's been the fact that, yes, nothing is perfect. The education system isn't perfect. We as young people aren't perfect. Everyone here as people aren't perfect. So everything can always improve, right? But the thing is for me, if I was to reset the system, the thing that I would say is the first thing that needs to change is the way that students and teachers are interacted with. So the way that teachers interact with students, which then in turn shows how students interact with teachers. Because, for example, when I was in school, a lot of adults carried around this bravado and this... They even said stuff like, you listen to my instructions, you're the child, I'm the teacher. And there's... In humans, we have a conscious and subconscious mind. In our subconscious mind, when people say that to us every single day, that's going to make us feel like we're less than. And that carries on into adult life. Because that's happened to me, where I go into places, and yes, I'm a confident person, I feel that. But sometimes I think to myself, I'm a young person here, will I be accepted or respected in this space? I still go and do my thing, but that shouldn't be in the back of my mind. And there's a specific story I remember from year seven, actually, when you know what year sevens are like. We'll remember us in year seven. You know, there's big sa saggy bags running to classes, all that kind of stuff. I remember I came late to my PE class because I didn't know where the PE room was and I was coming from another site in my school. I got in and my PE teacher started yelling in my face because I was late by five minutes and I'm year seven and I've been in secondary school for about a week or two. And Stuff like that shouldn't be happening to not only nobody, but let alone an 11 year old coming from, straight from primary school. So I think that the way that teachers and students interact with each other, I think we need to work on that. And maybe an idea is, I'm giving away a free idea, but maybe an idea is to maybe have an event where students and teachers can just talk and not be across the room from each other like it usually is in parents' even or meetings, but sitting with each other as well to show the unity that we can have in schools and I think that would be pretty beneficial for not only me and these guys as people that have obviously left school but also students in school to show them that they can talk to their teachers on a level yes there is a boundary for safeguarding but you can still have a re respectable and good professional relationship too so now what we're going to do is throw it over to you guys for questions so We've got Alison already with her hand up. So take it away, Alison, with your first question. And is it directed to anyone in particular? Uh, no, it's for everybody. First of all, just to say, I think you've been incredibly impressive. So thank you very much indeed for coming and sharing your views. Thinking about assessment, are there skills, things that you have done in your life to date that you would like to gain recognition for that you weren't given the chance to you know, that assessment didn't encompass. So assessment at the moment in schools is all about academic outcomes. We're trying to look at a broader view of assessment. Can you tell us what you think about those broader skills? What else might you be able to be assessed on that would help you, do you think? I would say one skill, if it's a skill, creativity. Yes. Um, a lot of students, and I'm sure all of us here as well, have elements of creativity within us. And I've, I, had, I had this debate actually with my mum two days ago that we're always just, you know, taught to revise for exams, exams, GCSEs, A-levels, uni, that's it. There is no sort of creativity in the classroom, in the, in the curriculum to allow students to bring that element of themselves into exams. There are times where I've done maths exams and the way I'd come up with an answer is slightly different to how I was taught, but that was because of my own intrinsic creative ability. Yeah. And so if we can have that in the assessment system where you allow students to embrace that creativity, it would really make a difference because everyone thinks differently. Everyone comes up to solutions differently. So embracing creativity is definitely something that should be included. Mm -hmm. to be able to measure improvement um, so for example if a student comes in and they're getting quite low grades but then they you know improve their grades quite a bit um, I think that should be kind of recognized as much if not more as the students who come straight in and always get A's or A stars because I think currently when you see a grade you just see it as a number without any of the holistic context so I think it should be 
kind of looking at effort as well as the actual um, outcome itself. Um, I think we should be able to recognise the skills that are going to go on CVs, like how that student is as a person. So are they confident? Are they a team player? Are they helping students out around the classroom? Are they showing the year sevens where to go in the hallway? Like we should be assessing that kind of stuff as well because that's the stuff that's going to matter to them later on in life. Not whether they got a nine in their English exam. That's, not, that's just going to show how smart they are, not, not what kind of a person they are to other people. And that's what really matters. Mm. Okay. Anyone else have anything to say on that? Okay, cool. Anyone else have a question? Okay, I don't know who to choose. Can I choose you in the burgundy top? Yeah. Can I just echo uh, a thanks for, for all of your contributions? It's been fantastic um, sitting here and listening to you guys. Um, just a quick question. I think that you, you kind of touched on it a bit, a bit as you were talking earlier about um, the, the, the way that the, the, the system um, gives out grades and they're, and they're permanent, you know, so if you've got an, an A or you've got an 8 or whatever, whatever it is in whatever system you've got. Do you have any thoughts on, on the change of that? Now obviously we can change what's examined and then how it's examined, but you've got that final outcome as well where you've, you know, you've got the stamp of an 8 or you've got the stamp of an A or a B or a C or whatever it may be. I'd be interested to know if, if you guys have thought of a, of a different way of, of, of giving it, you know, a, 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 perhaps a simple way is instead of giving A, B, C, D would be to, to give just a percentage score or something like that. So it would be really interesting. What, what are your thoughts on, 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 on the outcome of, of exams or assessments and, and how you'd like to see them perhaps change? That's a really um, good question. Um, <laughs> but I think my main thing would be that you leave school at, what, 16, 18 with that number and you keep it forever and you it's hard to change it so why are we leaving school with a number in the first place why why are we working all of our lives all of our childhoods to get a number at the end of the time we leave when people are so much more than that um so in my opinion kind of arbitrary exams in general need to be either very heavily reformed or scrapped and particularly in the arts because i mean i was very musical school i did drama i did dance and the way a lot of them are examined is how many times did you use a different dynamic in a dance? And I'm like, well, maybe you didn't want to. <laughs> maybe you didn't want it right. Um, and I think when everything is kept as such an arbitrary value, you're, you're just not getting the full picture. So in my opinion, they just need to go entirely. And I understand that employers maybe need that sort of benchmark to kind of work out what the next steps are. But yeah, no, I think least something else needs to be done. Um, I think also... Um recognising other qualifications. Um, I know that Ofcar have um, the levels um, from, I think, um, A-levels start at level three, level four, um, and then they go up to level six at degree level. Um, and um, I did um, another, um, I did a Trinity um, Arts Award um, qualification, and that wasn't assessed on if you got a pass merit distinction, it was just a pass. And um, it was very free with what you could do. And the examiner looked at how creative you were and, um, it was very, it was very free, and I think that uh, more qualifications like that should um, be included and be recognised, um, because not everybody wants to use UCAS points, um, and that could just be a qualification in itself. Um, and I also think we should bring back coursework, um, because not everybody um, can just do their exams at the end of the uh, two years, and that's it. Um, I think their um, coursework should be brought back, and um, I they did that in the pre-U qualifications. Um, um, and I know they scrapped those, so perhaps we should bring coursework back into A-levels um, at not just 30%, but maybe up to 70%. Lovely. Anyone else? One more person for this question. Cool. Okay. So we're going to go for one final question. And I want to... I feel bad. Like, I want to choose all of you, but I can't. <laughs> Can I choose... You with the blonde hair, with the, is it a turquoise scarf I see? Yes, it is. It's 2020 vision, yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the panelists for, for everything you've, you've said so far. Um, you've, you've given us accounts of, of extraordinary um, adversity that you've overcome in the, in the course of your educational journeys. Could you share with us something that, that, that made a difference for you at some point? What was the turning point for you um, that led you to be where you are today? Okay, I'm going to ask if two people could answer this one just for time, Biddy. Um, this is, yeah, this is like a massive one for me. Um, 
The turning point for me in my education system was definitely a certain teacher in high school. Um, he was called Mr. Ali, a little shout out. And he, if I was at a lesson because I was struggling with mental health, he would always come sit me in his office or he'd give me a little task to do, something to take my mind off it. And I think having those teachers in the education system is so important. Even in the job that I'm in now, I wouldn't be doing what I'd done now if my manager at the time hadn't turned around to me and said, you'd be really good at that, you should go for that. Yes. You know what you're saying, you know what you're doing, you can do it. So having them people in the education system that make a difference to students and don't just care about the grade that they're going to come out with at the end of the year, they are, they are the people that are the turning point, especially for people like me who might be struggling. or Because um, I come from Bradford, so it's not like, you know, it's not London, it's not... Um, so, yeah, recognising them people, and especially in lower-deprived areas as well, they are really massively important. Um, so, for me, when I um, applied to Cambridge, I was homeless at the time, like I mentioned before. Um, and I'd been homeless twice during that same year, um, and I'm a care leaver, so my local authority does still have a legal duty of care towards me as my corporate parents. Um, so I repeatedly reached out to ask them for help, both the local authority that took me into care and the one where I was living and had actually moved to running away from domestic abuse. Um, so I was in a very bad situation. I was on the streets during winter and I got so sick that I thought I would uh, die. Um, so I'd reached out to everyone I could possibly think of for help um, over and over again. And not only did I not receive any practical help like housing, but I also experienced a lot of cruelty. Um, so at one point I asked North Hertfordshire Council for help you know, when, when I was homeless and on the street. And uh, not only did they not house me, they told me I didn't, quote, deserve a home. And I don't really know what you have to do to deserve or not deserve a home. But you know, I was constantly reaching out for support and I was met with cruelty. Um, and I had attempted suicide at several points um, at that time because I kept reaching out and kept being rejected. Um, so I came across the Foundation Year online as something that was starting, and I didn't think I had any shot at getting in. I'd never been consistently involved in education, so I didn't do most of my uh, primary school years. I didn't just go to secondary school until about a month before I sat my GCSEs, so obviously my grades weren't very good. So I never actually thought I had a realistic shot at getting in, but I was you know, so desperate. I mean, I was desperate to the point where I was attempting suicide more than once. And I just needed something to hope for, to keep going. And then I, you know, I got in and it's been really great. So that's definitely been one of the biggest uh, points in my life. Lovely. So I want to say a few things. We're about to close, but firstly, can we give a round of applause to this amazing panel? Secondly, can all the staff members that work for the EDGE Foundation please stand up for us? Yes, yes, yes. L, L, come on. Ollie as well, can we give them all a round of applause? <laughs> yeah, you can sit down now. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to them because without them we wouldn't be here doing this panel. I've had a blast. I, I, th I think you guys have had a blast too. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. I'm right, cool, lovely. <laughs> So, and before we close, I just wanted to say a short story as well. And this isn't about me, by the way, so there's no trick in this, but it's something I use in a lot of my speeches and workshops when I go into schools. And it goes like this. There was an elephant in an elephant camp. Some of you may have heard this story before. And since it was a baby, it had a rope around its leg. But where it was, without the rope, the elephant could go out, go to the wild, and live its life and be free. But while it was a baby, that rope was around its leg, and it grew up and grew up and grew up until it was a grown elephant with a rope around its leg. But the rope broke, obviously, because the elephant's grown now. But the elephant didn't leave to go out into the wild like it could, go live its life, be free. And somebody walking through the zoo said to the zookeeper, the elephant could literally leave here and do whatever it wants. Why is the elephant not going anywhere? And the zookeeper said, the elephant for the whole of its life, including its childhood, the most important de developmental stages of its life, was prevented physically from doing something. Now as an adult, it can go out and do it. But mentally, the elephant is now trapping itself. And unfortunately, this is the case sometimes with young people and assessments. 
they think because the highest grade they got was a C or a 4, they can't go to Oxford when they're 35 or get a certain job. So I just wanted to leave you with all of that, leave you all of, sorry, leave you all with that, just to ponder on throughout the weeks, days after this event. But I've been Jonas Andrew Phillip. This has been our amazing youth panel, and thank you, everybody. <laughs>